welcome everybody thanks for joining us today i'm poonam yadav acmw uk chair and lecturer at university of york uk my co-host is anesthesia nashrova project coordinator at acmw uk chapter today it's my great pleasure to invite professor blanca rodridge a professor of computational medicine and welcome to our senior researcher at university of oxford uk um, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Rodri is going to talk about augmenting drug development and cardiology for with computer science. It seems like very interesting topic, given that we are now in hurry of COVID nineteen medicine. So I'm very excited to hear this talk. Um, I'm welcoming uh, Professor Bank Blanca to share her screen and start her presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, special invitation. Um, today, I will be sharing uh, some of the results we do, so some of the research we, we are doing in um, at the University of Oxford. And the first thing I would like to do is to acknowledge the people and the setup um, in which this work has been developed. We are based in computer science, and we have very active collaborations with industry. Um, uh, clinicians at hospitals and experimental people that and provide uh, to us the data sets and the knowledge that we need to uh, construct our computer models and also to make sense of the simulation results. So everybody in, in my team is used to these very interdisciplinary collaborations. And I will be talking to you about them as, as we, get, we go along. Um, so the concept we are uh, developing in, through our research is uh, human in silico trials. This is the use of multi-scale modeling and simulation for drug development, for testing therapies, and, and to test therapies in specific disease conditions. So the, 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 what we do is to integrate clinical and experimental data all about the human heart into computer models that we use to uh, run simulations to try to understand disease conditions and uh, the, what is very specific to specific patients about these disease conditions, and also to evaluate treatments even before they are given to, to patients in, and to human. And we are working very much in developing this concept with industry and with regulatory agencies, both in the US and in Europe. And you can see here some of the collaborations we have established through, throughout the years. So one of the, the very difficult uh, questions about drug development is uh, whether or not a particular therapy is going to be safe in addition to being uh, effective at treating a disease. Of course, in the news, you are seeing now um, a lot of information about COVID treatments and how these are tested in patients. Um, the, the, the very difficult question about who may experience adverse outcomes is also very important and very difficult to answer preclinically uh, because uh, established methods do not represent this population heterogeneity. And I'll, I'll describe this a bit better later. So this is a big challenge, this population heterogeneity and how to predict whether a treatment is going to be safe is a huge challenge that is actually addressed from different perspectives in academia, in clinical settings, in regulatory agencies and in industry. And so it's a very intersectoral problem. You have seen in the news a lot about COVID treatments. I couldn't give this talk without actually mentioning uh, specifically, specifically hydroxychloroquine. This is the drug that Trump was taking um, and that was uh, later shown to be very ineffective for COVID treatment. And, and one of the key issues of this malaria treatment is that it can lead to sudden cardiac death. It affects the heart and it's known to affect the heart and depending on the dose and the particular condition of the patient, it can actually lead to cardiac death. So this was very recently in the news. Um, the reason why some of these drugs uh, can lead to sudden cardiac death and why hydro uh, hydroxyl uh, chloroquine leads to cardiac death is because it, it, in addition to its effects in the lungs and for malaria, it also targets a particular protein in the heart called the heart current. So at the subcellular level, the drug 
affects this hair current, and that has a range of effects in the heart that are well known but still under investigation, and that can lead to sudden cardiac death. This is very well known for um, drug companies. It's a, one of the big dangers in drug development. If a drug is uh, affecting this hair current, it's very, very, very likely that it won't be accepted by regulators uh, to, to be released to the market unless there is a very, very particular uh, benefit that outweighs the safety concerns. So um, in answering, is this a cardio safe drug uh, in terms of industry, regulators, academia, and clinical setting, um, th there is a need to evaluate the, how it affects the heart, how the drug would affect the heart from these proteins at the subcellular level, and specifically this heart current, to the cellular function, to the whole organ. Uh, level. So this is what we call a multi-scale problem. And this is why uh, modeling, multi-scale modeling and simulation is very suitable to uh, be used in this context because we have computer models that uh, collect the information from experiments, they, we integrate it in the form of equations, and we are able to simulate all this range of uh, scales. Currently, uh, the way this question, is this a cardio-safe drug, is addressed is very much using animal models. And you can see here an estimation of the number of animal experiments that are used preclinically in industry. And it's a range of animals, uh, so including rodents, rabbits, um, um, and, and bigger animals, especially dogs, uh, are very much used for, to answer this question. And this has a range of problems. The first one is animals are not human, and they differ very much in terms of the, the, these properties, these electrical properties in the heart. They are different. And the other one is that uh, usually people with adverse outcomes, such as very lethal arrhythmias, are diseased. So they have some sort of cardiac condition that makes them weaker to these effects. And the animals used in research are very often healthy. So there are a range of problems with the, um, the use of animals uh, to answer this question, and we are keen to produce alternatives. So this, is, this slide um, really um, illustrates the, the methods we're using in our research, the computer science methods we're using that involve multi-scale modeling and simulation. And you can see here that this is again multi-scale. So we have representation of subcellular ionic currents, and then we integrate experimental data about each of these currents in the form of ordinary differential equations, very much following the Hodgkin-Huxley formulation. We integrate these into cellular models, which would be systems of ordinary differential equations. And these are integrated into partial differential equations for simulations at the whole organ level. So we can really simulate the electrical activity of the human heart from subcellular mechanisms that are targeted by drugs to whole organ behavior that would be very much related to clinical, um, clinical settings and, and also clinical uh, biomarkers or clinical signals like the electrocardiogram. So this is in a, in, a, in a nutshell what our methods are. And we solve these equations using uh, numerical methods um, with especially software that we have developed in the group. So uh, using this model, multi-scale modeling and simulation, which is quite advanced and that was uh, that it started in 1960s with Dennis Novel. So we've had a range of years uh, where we have been developing this technology. We are really pushing for um, modeling and simulation to become another way of testing drug development, in addition to the established in vitro testing, animal testing, and clinical trials. And this has been uh, coined as, uh, with the term in silico trials for computational trials. It's very much used in um, uh, modeling and simulation is very used in other industries in, in the, um, the development of cars or planes. It's very standard to use modeling and simulation and medical therapies is, is a bit behind. Uh, perhaps devices are more advanced in the use of modeling and simulation. And there was a very nice seminar by Medtronic, one of the big companies where they were discussing how they use modeling and simulation for drug development. It's a bit, uh, we are a bit behind, but the doors are being opened. So it's a very exciting time. So one of the key issues, I, as I was um, talking about before, is that uh, we are all different and therefore it is very difficult to predict how a drug is going to affect 
every particular person in, in the universe and whether or not uh, some of these people will experience adverse outcomes such as very little arrhythmias. So we, we started to tackle this challenge through modeling and simulation uh, and we first identified how these we are all different is true not only uh, at the body level and external level but also inside and in, inside our hearts. So when we looked at experimental data from our collaborators um, in human cells, we saw that the recordings exhibited a really wide range of variability. So it was really important to try to understand how these different recordings or different experimental data and different cells could be uh, um, represented in our modeling and simulation and how that could shed light potentially to this question, is this drug cardio safe? If it's not, in which populations we should be very careful about. So we really went, maybe also because our group is very diverse, uh, we embraced this, trying to understand this diversity in the experimental recordings. So uh, this is how the field was before we started to embark in this uh, studies of variability. So we had one computer model for a human cell and we had one answer per simulation. And you can see here the, in red the experimental recordings, in black um, the, the output of a simulation. And the state of the art in the field was that we would run one simulation um, per, per model and, and that was the outcome. So what we proposed is rather than having only one model, we would have populations of models and rather than having one set of ordinary differential equations we would have uh, thousands of them where the structure of the equations is the same but the parameters in the in the model would vary very broadly and would be sampled in a very wide range and that enabled us to create these populations of models and of course, this has the advantage that we can simulate the effect of drugs, not only in one cell, but in thousands of cells. And, and the computer power is not really a problem for this. Um, so th through this research, Oli Britton, who was a PhD student uh, with me and Alfonso Buenorovio at that time, won the NC3R's prize, which is really good, especially for early career researchers, because it comes with a research grant. So this was uh, quite a novelty uh, at the time and we have exploited it for uh, drug safety. So at the same time as we published this paper in 2013, the US Food and Drug Administration, which is the body that um, uh, approves uh, drugs uh, in the US, launched uh, the SIPA initiative um, that was very much about replacing some of the clinical studies that are do done uh, in drug development through by the use of uh, modeling and simulation. So it was the first time that really the FDA was pushing together with industry as well, but they were pushing to incorporate modeling and simulation in uh, uh, drug testing. And also in Europe, uh, the Avicenna Alliance uh, launched also a roadmap for the implementation of in silico clinical trials and the European um, medical agency is now embracing it and seeing how they can develop the framework for it. So it, it's been, it, all, all, all these last years have been quite transformational and the process has been quite slow. So the SIPA initiative, they wanted to implement it in 2015 and we are still in discussions about validation of the models, uh, what type of model, um, how much do we trust these simulations, and there, there are lots of discussions still, but it is certain that industry has opened up to the uh, embracing of this modeling and simulation and the replacement of uh, some of the animal testing. So one of the key studies uh, we published, I'll, I'll talk to you about it later, but I thought also that one of the things that um, that were really interesting was the reaction and the skepticism of people uh, in industry and throughout about modeling and simulation and this has been really present in all the discussions about modeling very broadly about COVID and um, this is Anthony Fauci uh, who was uh, talking in the news about how skeptical he is about models and, and there's been a lot of discussion about it lately. And we encountered the same experience. People were skeptical. They were doing animal testing. Why would they trust suddenly modeling and simulation, even if they had data about it? And what we saw 
was that um, skepticism is, of course, a very interdisciplinary issue. And if you are an experimental biologist, you will be skeptical about something you don't know and you don't understand very well. So we uh, had to work not only on providing data sets, but also opening doors um, through providing to people uh, ways to experience modeling and simulation as their own. So uh, I'll talk to you about how we did that. But it, it's been a very interesting experience. So one of the papers that uh, was quite important to us was to show that through populations of models, we could predict the accurate, um, with higher accuracy than animal models, whether or not a drug would lead to adverse outcomes and prorhythmic prorhythmic uh, behavior in the human population. And this was work by Elisa Passini, who also won uh, the 3Rs prize by the MC3Rs uh, in 2017. So in this paper, we did several things. One of them was to develop a software that was very easy to use. So our modeling and simulation software is academic, students, postdocs have been developing it. And what we did is to work with funding from Oxford to develop a software that is very easy to use by anybody, even if they are not experts in modeling and simulation. And this is virtual essay. And this software enables for simulations using populations of human cell models uh, uh, through incorporating also um, uh, drug effects on ion channels. So we get uh, data from pharmaceutical companies on how the drug affects cardiac cells at the ionic level. And we simulate the effect on populations of human cells. Uh, and we determine several biomarkers from the simulations. We quantify several properties. And then we compare the output of the simulations to the reported arrhythmic risk in the human populations of these same, same drugs. So several things are important here. Uh, one of them is that the added advantage of these simulations is, is that they are human-based. And that's already an, uh, an advantage compared to animal testing. Um, the second one is the software that is very easy to use and we shared it freely with our industry co uh, collaborators at, at the beginning. Um, so what Elisa found is that for, for, um, for about 60 compounds, the accuracy of the predictions um, was 90%. So with the software and with the information on the drug effect on ion channels, we were able to predict with 90% of accuracy whether or not a drug was cardiotoxic. And we did this with Janssen, and then slowly we built up additional collaborations with different industry partners that wanted to do the validation in a slightly different way. And we published several papers with each of them, um, showing always that the accuracy of the predictions was very close to 90%. But that exercise of collaborating with them, providing the software for them to use in-house, experiencing modeling and simulation as a new um, tool for them was extremely important in opening doors to a new technology. So that was a, an interesting experience. These are, we generated, of course, these actually this collaboration with industry was very good to, to everybody who embarked in this because it provided motivation for their work, but also we were able to publish everything and they provided lots of data. We also collaborated with regulators uh, in setting these uh, frameworks for in silico trials um, and it's, this is very recent, so it's 2020, so it's ongoing work. So the, the big challenge in, in, uh, in this is, is also how we represent disease. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the, the people who experience these adverse outcomes of disease are generally older people. They are, uh, have disease conditions, uh, cardiac disease conditions. And it is very important to understand disease. Uh, to be able to develop this in silico trials framework. So I'll illustrate uh, how we have used the combination of machine learning and modeling and simulation to try to understand a disease condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the, the clinical details of, the, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are not particularly important in this setting, but it's more to illustrate how the combination of machine learning and modeling and simulation can be very powerful. This is a, a disease condition that kills young people. 
it's genetic, so it's inherited, and it leads to abnormalities in the heart at uh, a range of levels. Uh, it comes from a mutation that affects uh, the, the ionic properties, the tissue, it leads to thicker hearts, uh, and that promotes arrhythmia. So what we wanted to understand in this work is the variability of phenotypes and of expression of this disease in a group of patients. So some patients with these mutations are absolutely fine and they have no arrhythmias, but some others with the same mutation die suddenly. And it's very difficult to understand that uh, diversity. So we uh, used machine learning to try to tackle this uh, variability. Uh, and this is the framework in which we worked. So we had the electrocardiograms for these patients, for 86 uh, patients with the disease, and we extracted some biomarkers on the, the shape of these ECGs. And then we uh, applied feature selection, clustering algorithms, and through this, uh, we uh, identified um, four clusters of patients that had um, different phenotypes in the ECGs, but that uh, um, were, could be grouped in these four groups. Um, this is the, the result of the analysis of this clustering algorithm. Um, and those four groups of patients were more or less of equal size. The first one had a mostly normal uh, ECG, and this would be a very healthy looking ECG, whereas group three had a more abnormal ECG. Um, sorry, this one is the healthy one, the group 1B. Uh, the run, group 1A would have an inverted two wave. So this is, you can see that it's inverted with respect to this one. Now, the, the four groups of patients were identified and in the MRI, we could see that the shape of the ventricles of the hearts of these patients were, was also different. And this one had a higher risk of uh, arrhythmias. So the, the clustering algorithm was very um, uh, good at identifying these groups of patients, but we had no idea whether or not this uh, anatomical uh, shape, the, the fact that these patients had hypertrophy in apex and base, in apex and septum, sorry, in two places, was explaining these ECGs. So uh, this was work by Aurore Lyon, who also was a PhD student at that time. And what we did is to uh, develop multi-scale modeling and simulation to answer the question, why do these patients have an abnormal ECG? How can that be explained? What are the mechanisms? So what we did is to develop anatomical models uh, from these clinical images uh, through a complicated pipeline of image processing and mesh generation. And this allowed us to represent anatomically the heart and the torso of a specific patient. And then we embedded these anatomical meshes in a simulation framework to simulate the electrical activity through the heart up to the uh, simulation of the ECG. So this is a very powerful tool because it enables answer, asking questions about whether the shape of the heart would explain the ECG or it needs to be something else. So uh, what Aurore did is to ask those questions and try to understand what of this range of mechanisms could explain these abnormal ECGs in patients that have a higher arrhythmic risk. So was it the ionic remodeling, something about the fibrosis of the heart, the shape of the heart, or something else? So she ran simulations to try to answer uh, each of those questions. And this is just an example. And um, at the top, you have the clinical recording. And then at the bottom, you have simulations done with abnormalities in different areas of the heart highlighted in red. And you can see how the simulations are providing ECGs that in some cases uh, appear more similar to the real clinical ECG. But it's that ability of modeling and simulation to test hypotheses about what could explain that clinical ECG. That's what's very powerful. So at the end, uh, the answer we gave was that uh, in the, the patients that had a mixed le uh, left ventricular hypertrophy and high arith higher arrhythmic risk, uh, this could only be explained by ionic remodeling in the apex, uh, whereas in group three, the abnormalities in QRS had to come from conduction system abnormalities. So that's very specific, uh, the specialist knowledge from 
cardiology, but uh, the ov overall message is, was that we were able to explain this different, to identify four phenotypes and then to explain um, what are the mechanisms that would lead to those abnormal ECGs in the most priority cases. So this, this idea of uh, combining statistical modeling or machine learning uh, with modeling and simulation is something that has been developed in a, in a paper called the Digital Twin on the Digital Twin that was published very recently in the European Heart Journal. And this study was one of the examples of how this ma machine learning uh, can identify what, what are the phenotypes, what are the speci specific features that we need to pay attention to and modeling and simulation can explain those features, uh, uh, especially because they have this representation of multi-scale uh, uh, processes. So just to finish, I hope I have illustrated how we are uh, using a modeling and simulation in drug development and also in cardiology through these two examples. Um, I, I believe it's a very powerful and advanced technology, especially in terms of cardiac electrophysiology. Um, and uh, it enables us to integrate and uh, analyze clinical and experimental da data sets in very powerful ways. Uh, the work is very intersectoral, so we engage with industry regulators, clinicians, and experimentalists, and, and their input, the input of these collaborations is critical. Uh, it is challenging sometimes, but it is very, very important. And our focus is to explain human variability in health and disease. We demonstrated 90% accuracy in predicting drug-induced arrhythmias with the compounds that were available at the time. Um, and our focus is, of course, our focus in, in our advantage is that we have human-based models as opposed to animal models. And the ability to um, also simulate disease heart. We, we simulate myocardial ischemia, myocardial infarction that are very common disease conditions. Uh, and we can analyze the data with very high special temporal resolution. So those are really important advantages we have with respect to animals in research. And uh, our work has already contributed to replacing some of the animals in research uh, and in preclinical testing. And we are very much working with the National Center for the Three Rs um, to further uh, show the, uh, the, the advantage of this technology with respect to animal testing. So, um, if you have, uh, if you want to have more information about any of this, um, we have a website, and I, I'll be very keen to answer any questions. Thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor um, Blank. Patrick, uh, can you ask your question? Hello. Yeah. Can, can you hear, hear me? You? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is. Um, you're doing this work with the heart. And yes. I am really intrigued with seeing that. But I'm thinking there may be areas in healthcare where these mo the science isn't far enough along to be able to build these models. And so I was wondering your thoughts on when it is or is not appropriate to be working towards models. Um, I'm thinking of, for example, microbiome research. Yeah. When is animal research appropriate? Yeah, I mean, I think animal research is appropriate in a lot of contexts, and um, and uh, and uh, that's recognized by everybody that is uh, serious uh, about science in in the three R's. I mean, maybe this is going to be a bit controversial, but um, yeah, I would certainly think that uh, animals are are uh, important in research. What I'm pushing forward is that. Um, in some cases, as you were uh, referring to, where the modeling is mature, because the knowledge is mature, then um, we can use modeling and simulation instead of animal experiments. And this is what we were pushing for. Um, this is something that has been, uh, that is being investigated in other areas. So for example, I, I was just listening to a seminar by Shannon Lee from Sheffield that was talking about uh, osteoporosis and bone, bone simulations, and that's very, very advanced. And uh, there are other people who are talking, uh, who are doing a very uh, relevant work on diabetes research. Medtronic was talking about it. The lung function is another area that is quite advanced. Uh, I'm not so familiar with the microbiome, but I'm, uh, I, I would be very interested in knowing experiences about that. 
in our case, um, I guess we've done, so the maturity has also come from our own work and where we have been able to demonstrate the power of the models is also by engaging very much with experimentalists uh, to also generate the data we needed for the models. Um, so it's been a, a very important partnership that uh, has been going on for over 10 years. Thank you. That makes a great deal of sense. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have one more question from Anastasia. Uh, how accurate is the animal testing, testing prediction? So in, uh, in, for prorhythmical detoxicity, we referred to a paper where um, it was about 75% um, what they were finding. Uh, and our predictions were 90% 90, 90 for that particular form of cardiotoxicity. Now, uh, the, um, the, when, they, when companies run animal uh, experiments, they don't look only generally at one endpoint or one type. So for example, if the compound is affecting temperature, we wouldn't be able to, uh, to um, predict with our models because we don't have those processes. So one need, in replacing of animals, one needs to be very careful what the experiments are being used for and whether all the processes that are being looked at are uh, reproduced by the models. So in, in the case of some of the experiments, they were only looking at prorhythmia and that's why they could be replaced. The, the, the experiments that we're looking at other things uh, weren't the, weren't, uh, we weren't able to replace them. And that's why we're looking at other endpoints and other processes like contractility, for example, now to see whether we can further this research. Thank you so much. Amazing, inspirational talk. Uh, our, um, our next, um, uh, Lily, would you like to ask your question, please? Uh, yes. And uh, there is one topic about the classification or detection of the disease, the hearts. I remember there's one slide. And uh, so for that problem, uh, usually what kind of features do you get? Um, like some from the ECG signal and uh, some from image signals and uh, because that the problem quite new for me and I'm quite interested from that slide. Yeah, so that, that's work by uh, Orléans and in, uh, in that paper, what we were keen to do is to identify um, different, different types of ECGs. Um, so we didn't take into account any of the uh, image data. We only took the ECGs and what we extracted is more information on the shape or the morphology of that ECG. So usually clinicians would measure the length of the segments, but not the shape. And that we, our hypothesis that was that the morphology of the ECG was giving a lot of information about the condition of the patient. Uh, and that's why we quantify that morphology using a specific mathematical model. It's all uh -huh. in the paper. so. It, you can just find all the details there. And um, can you also share the paper's name? Yeah, so it's the, the first and author. Maybe, is, I mean, later after the... Yeah, after yeah, the, I mean, the yeah. first author is Leon, so um, yeah, it's all in our website as well, but yeah, I'm happy to share, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Lilian and Blanco. Now, uh, we have another question, uh, question from Vesalis. Uh, have these models been validated in different populations? Oh, that's a very interesting question, actually. And, and it was very important. Um, so when, uh, when we first started with the populations of models, um, the, the experimentalists were reluctant to share the data with us um, because they usually in experimental research variability is a bad thing because it prevents you from having very uh, good p-values. So in the, in the experimental papers, the, the mean and the standard deviation were reported and the, 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 the variability itself wasn't reported. So when we started with the first population of models, um, some other experimentalists were saying this variability is error. Um, 
it's, it's experimental error. It's not true variability. Even though everybody is very different from the outside, they were skeptical that the cells could be so different. So it was very important for us to, uh, to engage with very different experimentalists and to demonstrate the validity of the approach and the populations for different data sets and for, for different um, uh, still human data sets, but uh, still, uh, different cell types. So that uh, applying the same, the same methodology to different populations was very important in the end. So, uh, yeah, thank you for your answer. So, so did you validate it and did you get the same degree of accuracy in, in the different you know, populations? Yes. Okay. The, the, and also, in fact, what we did as well is that we, when we had a very large population of models, um, of a thousand models, you know, and then um, we run the, the drug trials with that population and we saw that um, certain models were more prone to ab abnormalities. So we developed a smaller population with a specific ionic profiles and we run the study again and we obtain the same accuracy. And in fact, we develop a new model that was also um, updated and we develop a new population, we run things again and we got the same accuracy. So we, we yeah, I mean, the, the skepticism by the industry is larger than, than we think. So we had to go through a lot of validation processes in different settings and different populations. But um, have you done this with real data or just simulations? So what do you mean? I mean, you tried it, your models on different data, uh, different populations with real data or just it was all simulations? So the, we, the experimental data, we use them as input and those are real experimental data for, for the drugs, we, how the drugs affect the ion channels, those are real data. The, the calibration of the population are with real data and the output of the simulation is compared to real clinical data. Okay. Okay, so, so the, the validation has been done with real clinical data as input and as output. Okay. Um, and that's why we, we compute, that's how we compute the accuracy of the predictions by looking at how many drugs, real drugs are classified as risky with the simulations and whether or not that agrees with the clinical reports. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have one question because I, um, I, I do understand machine learning and uh, data science concept, but I, I, I come from different part of computer science background. So um, how, I, I found it's very quite challenging. How do you um, uh, basically pick that this kind of problems could be modeled by uh, you can simulate, but some are can't be simulated. How is it something very intuitive, or already there is a lots of research already present there, or is it sometime you try that and then you figure out, oh, this is not possible to simulate or model because yeah, we're... I mean in our case, um, I refer to it. So we are building on uh, more than fifty years of research. Uh, and uh, in, at the beginning, so there is a, a really good paper by Dennis Noble, who is the person who invented the field and who is still a professor here in Oxford. So he developed the first model of um, a, the electrical activity in a cardiac cell in his PhD in, in the 1960s, 1950s actually, and uh, um, he published in 1960s. So the, the first models were very simple. Um, because we didn't have knowledge about the underlying processes. So they, they didn't even know which type of proteins were uh, producing this electrical activity. And then through um, comparison to experimental data and new knowledge that was coming from experimental data and they could integrate in the models, the, the complexity of the models started to increase and also the kind of the details that were included in the models. So um, it's been an iteration of over 50 years. And in 2011, Euron Brody and, and Tomohara published uh, a, a very comprehensive model of um, human ventricular action potential using data from uh, SEGET. 
um, and, uh, and other people have been producing very, very good models of human behavior uh, over the years. And it's that testing and that iteration and comparison with experimental data and clinical data that has allowed to have models of the maturity that enable this type of simulations. So the, the, the changes we have performed, we also um, published a, a, a new model um, in late 2019 that was an, an improvement over, over the established ones. And it, it, it was done by identifying what doesn't agree with the experimental data and how we can improve that based on experimental knowledge and new experimental data. So it's been a, a very long iteration and we build on a lot of research that has been going on over many years. Yeah, uh, thank you. Because I can understand now, uh, it's just one is the knowledge, but then the data itself, it's a long. Yeah, and, and it's very important to have those uh, collaborators that um, where there is um, mutual trust that we can, um, work with to challenge the models to see what works in the models what doesn't work and how we can improve them then because at the end the models are a summary of the knowledge we have on the physiological processes and uh, we don't know everything so the models will fail in the things we don't know yeah uh, thank you so much uh, we have one more question Petrika asked uh, how does validation occurs Oh, well, we can write a book about it, I'm afraid. So um, validation is a very, I'm serious that we could write a book about validation. So um, in our modeling framework, validation has occurred in two levels. One, it's whether or not we can reproduce experimental data at the cellular level. So if we're using cellular models, can we replicate cellular experiments? That's the first level. So does the signal that we obtain look the same? Is it, are the, the properties in range? Um, is everything consistent uh, in terms of cellular level? The second type of validation uh, in the in silico trials is the one I was referring to in the discussion with Vasilis. Whether or not the use of these populations of models allows us to predict arrhythmic risk in the population. And that's a different type of validation because what we're looking for is whether we can identify drugs that are risky, as in clinical reports. So those, those two levels of validation are extremely important and would always be partial validation because there are things we don't know. So um, that's why we don't have perfect accuracy because some of the drugs would have modes of action that we, we don't pick up from the uh, drug ion channel interactions, for example. Um, so, so it's a very interesting topic, but it's, it's a long answer, I'm afraid. Uh, thank you. Um, there's one more question from Lily. Uh, I'm just reading the question here. How does one model become journal to human patients as usually different population have different ECG characteristics, for instance? Does this model monitor the drug dose change, uh, not only on time, but also on spatial information? Does that require large computation as the ECG is usually measured only uh, major focus on specific reason? Yeah, no, we don't, we don't simulate long time frames and that's a very important question as well. Um, we don't and also the, the, the information we have in terms of drug ion channel interaction is static. So in terms of um, long time series for ECGs, we have simulated, for example, changes in heart rate of several minutes and all of that can be done, perhaps not in whole organ models, but um, this is a really interesting question that needs further computational resources probably. Uh, thank you so much.